Please be seated. Scripture reading will be from Joshua 6, 1 through 16. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho to, into your hands with its kings and its valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priest and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let the seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Then he said to the people, Go forward and march around the city, and let the armed men go on before the Ark of the Lord. And it was so that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the Lord went forward and blew the trumpets, and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets and the ram, and the rear guard came after the ark while they continued to blow the trumpets. But Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or let your voice be heard, nor let the word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once. Then they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Now Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpet. And the armed men went before them, and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while they continued to blow the trumpets. Thus the second day they marched around the city once and returned to camp. They did so for six days. Then on the seventh day they rose early in the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day did they march around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priest blew the trumpet, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Thanks, Dave. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning, saints. That sounded a little weak. Good morning, saints. Good morning. That sounded better. Got to make sure you're awake before I put you to sleep. Last Lord's Day was one of the most encouraging Lord's Days. One of our shepherds, Mark, had a prayer for all of our children from college age down to preschool. And just before he had that prayer, I asked all of those in that age group to come forward, and it looked like a third of the audience stood up. Now, some of those may have wished they were in that age group, but that was encouraging, wasn't it? I just got one amen out of that. And then Sunday night, we had a special worship service where we sang songs, but we did it under the pavilion, and then we had a cookout after that. And we had one of the largest, we had the largest attendance, 107, I think, that we've had on a Sunday night for worship in probably two years. And that was encouraging. So we're glad to see that. Today we celebrate uh, Brandon and Sydney's upcoming wedding with the ladies hosting a, a, a wedding shower for them. So we're going to be celebrating with them today. 
Next Lord's Day is our kickoff for the new lads year. Uh, and so Jared wants to have a meeting with all of the adults very briefly. He emphasized brief uh, in the, the classroom there. And so that kickoff lads day is going to be next Sunday. I think if you've got children or grandchildren, they're at least four years old, they can be involved in the lads program. So you may want to consider that. And then also next Sunday, Lynn Carroll's family is sponsoring a, an 80th birthday party. You don't turn 80 every day, right? So we're going to celebrate uh, Lynn's birthday party next Sunday as she turns 80 years old. And then the Sunday after that, things are getting back to normal, right? The Sunday after that, we have a retirement party uh, for Donna Oakman, who served as the church secretary for 27 years now, the elders are going to start looking for her replacement, and so if you would like to apply for the position of church secretary, see Mark. He's going to be the point man for that. But as we were talking about this process, I said, of course, Clarence is the oldest elder among us, and I said, have you ever in, uh, uh, hired a church secretary? No, Donna was here before Clarence became an elder, so all of us are brand new with this church secretary hiring process. So pray for us. Uh, as we go through that process. And as I said, if you'd like to apply for that position, then see Mark. Uh, he has the information for that. And because last Sunday night went so well, we're going to try it again first Sunday in October with a homemade ice cream get-together on a Sunday night after services. Uh, if the weather permits, maybe we'll move our worship service back outside under the pavilion and sing again. Uh, but homemade ice cream, first Sunday in October. Somebody bring some hot apple cider to go with our homemade ice cream. First Sunday in October. One more point, one more thing I would like to announce is this Wednesday night, I start a new class on Wednesday night here in the auditorium, The Life of a Seed, Sowing the Life of Your Dreams. And this is a practical application of the parable of the sower from Mark chapter 4. And so we're going to talk about what it takes to have a successful life based on principles that are found in God's Word. Now this class is not really geared towards those who are 60 and 70, okay? They've got most of their life behind them, sorry, but they do, okay? This class is for those who are in their 20s and 30s and 40s and even 50s uh, who are still... Uh, making some decisions about the future of their lives. So I invite you to be with, with us this Wednesday night for Bible class here in the auditorium. Mark and I are going to be taking turns teaching that class. Let's get into our study this morning. Do you have your copy of God's Word open to Joshua chapter 6? This is where we're going to be spending our time this morning and focusing our hearts. No! Don't do that. It's not going to work. There is no way. We tried that before. Are those words, words or phrases of victory or words of defeat? Well, it might depend on whether or not you're saying those words or hearing those words, right? But the source of that message is going to be either a source of fear or a source of truth. The Lads program for this next calendar year is studying the book of Joshua. And so Jared and, and I are working on these studies that we're presenting to the congregation. They're on the table in the foyer, on the table as you go out that door, where we're encouraging the whole congregation to study the book of Joshua together. And so this morning I wanted to pull one of those events out of the life of Joshua and look at that event this morning. Dan did a great job reading about that event for us this morning, but I want us to spend some time talking about the destruction of the walls of Jericho and how God did that in such an unusual and strange way. Now here's what's going on with Joshua by the time we get to this point. Moses has died, and God has chosen Joshua to take over the leadership of Israel in the place of Moses. In Joshua chapter 2, Joshua has sent some spies into the land in order to determine what are the weaknesses, what's the best way to proceed in taking over the land. Because Israel has to have a place to live in order for God to become flesh and dwell among men. 
Now Joshua doesn't see the big picture. God hasn't revealed to Joshua the big picture. But you and I, because we have the whole Bible, we know the big picture. Joshua's got to get Israel ready for the coming of God to the world. And so Joshua has to take over this promised land. Joshua chapter 3, Joshua leads Israel across the Jordan River on dry land as they're getting ready to enter into the promised land. And one reason why God did that is to, is to work this special miracle through Joshua so that when we come to the city of Jericho, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, Israel will have confidence that God's going to take care of things. Okay? Chapters 4 and 5 of Joshua, Joshua is getting the nation of Israel ready. Get their hearts ready for God to work through them on this occasion. And so Jericho is the first major city across the Jordan River that God wants Israel to conquer. All right, so let's get the text in front of us a little more closely. And then we'll come back and make a couple of relevant points from the text. First of all, Israel takes over Jericho. Notice verses 1 and 2. Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel... And no one went out and no one came in. That is to emphasize that Jericho was well defended. It's going to take a massive army, or the God of heaven, to take over Jericho. Verse 2, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its valiant warriors. Notice right there how God uses the past tense. Joshua, I've given you the city. There it is. Go take it. It's a done deal. It's yours. God gave them this land, this city. And then God gives them the command to go take the city and what exactly they're supposed to do. Beginning in verse 3. You shall march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city once. And you shall do this for six days. Also seven priests will carry the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Covenant. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, uh, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. Doesn't God do things strangely sometimes? Why? Why did God command Israel to take Jericho in such a unique way? God does strange things in order to help mankind understand that God can save by many people or by few people. 1 Samuel 14 and verse 6. God does strange things in His followers' lives in order to help us understand that sometimes the race is not won by the fastest and the battle is not always won by the strongest and the wealthy are not always the ones that are the most wise and understanding. Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes. You remember when God commanded Gideon to separate the nation of Israel when they were fighting against the Midianites? And some of them had to dip down and and lap the water. On that occasion, God says, I am doing this strange thing so that your confidence will not be in yourself. That you will not say, I'm the one who gave myself that victory but in order to teach us to be humble. Now you think about the children of Israel marching around this wall of Jericho. This, this, this wall is, how high is this ceiling? 20 feet? So we're marching around the walls of Jericho, and what's going through the mind of the Israelites? Are they going to shoot arrows down here and kill us? Are they going to throw javelins over the wall and kill us? We're marching around the walls of the cities, of the, the walls of Jericho just once a day. 
And then we go back to our camp. Maybe the Israelites are worrying. Are they going to shoot us while we are defenseless? But they put their trust in God. And they did what God told them to do. And so we go on reading, beginning in verse 6, where Israel did what God commanded them to do. That is the theme that runs through the whole book of Joshua. If you've not started reading it yet, every time you read this phrase, Joshua did as Moses commanded. You highlight that in... Let's highlight that in blue. Okay? Highlighted in blue. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant. Let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Covenant, which is what God commanded. And he said to the people, Go forward and march around the city. Let the army and go on before the Ark of the Lord. And it was so that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blew the trumpets, the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark while they continued to blow the trumpets. But Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor let your voice be heard, nor let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout, and then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once, and they came to the camp and spent the night in the camp. Joshua rose early in the morning. The priest took up the ark of the Lord. Seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually, blew the trumpets. The armed men went before them. The rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while they continued to blow the trumpets. Second day they marched around the city once, returned to the camp, did so for six days. The point is, notice that the historian... We can suppose it's Joshua. The historian is telling us exactly what God commanded, and then he's telling us Joshua did exactly what God commanded. That's why all the details, okay, she might be saying, you know what, Dan just read that. We don't have to read it again. I'm trying to emphasize that they did exactly what God commanded. That's the reason God wrote it this way. So verse 15, Seventh day they arose early at the dawning of the day, marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And, this, and, and then we uh, drop down to verse 20. And the people shouted, and the priest blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and then they took the city. Do you think as Israel is marching around the city that one time a day for six days, that the people of Jericho are mocking them and laughing at them? Where's the... Where's the ramp to climb the wall? Where's your battering ram? Where's your catapult? Now it says some of them were armed. We don't know what kind of weapons they had. But they didn't have those weapons that you would normally have in order to break down a wall or break down the gates of the city. They didn't have any of that. Archaeologists today suggest that Jericho was about eight or nine acres. And that's about the size of the property the church has here, right? Eight or nine acres. And so it'd take maybe 30 minutes or so to march around the outside of that city. And so they did that. And just as surely as they did what God commanded them to do, The walls came down flat, and Israel enters into that well-defended city, and they take it over in order to have a place to live, in order to be prepared for the coming of Jesus into this world. Now that we've got the story of Jericho in front of us, There's two main points that I want to bring out from this study. Number one, we need to reflect honestly and sincerely on the justice of God. Point number one, family, God is patient. God is a patient God. 
The city of Jericho was an extremely old city. The city itself dates all the way back before the time of Abraham, which means we're going at least 2,000 years before the time of Jesus Christ. And God promised this land to Abraham, who lived around 2000 B.C., But God told Abraham, your family is not going to take over this land because the sin of the people has not yet reached its completion. God is very patient. God is extremely patient. But God gave the people of Jericho ample opportunity to change their hearts and changed their behavior. They were well known for their wickedness. You name the sin and the people of Canaan practiced that sin. But God gave them opportunity to repent. Look back at Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1 real quickly. It came about when all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the king of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed, that their hearts melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. Now just let that sink in. God caused the waters of the Jordan River to divide so that the Israelites could walk across on dry land partly so that the people in Canaan would know that Israel's God was all-powerful. And it had an effect. The people in the land of Canaan and the city of Jericho, their hearts melted. They were afraid of the God of Israel. God's given them opportunity to change their behavior. Look back at chapter 2. Look at Rahab, the prostitute. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. When, when Joshua sends out the spies and they're spying out the, the city of Jericho, Rahab says to the men, I know that Jehovah has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. Notice what she says. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og whom you utterly destroyed. The crossing of the Red Sea on dry land. Rahab says, we remember that. That happened 40 years before. But the event was still fresh in the mind of Rahab and her family. And so she believed that the God of Israel is going to conquer this land. And she repented in her heart and she wanted to become members of God's people. Look over at the Gibeonites in chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And we see the exact same response from these people. Verses 9 and 10, they come and they make a treaty with Joshua. They deceive Joshua. That's a story for a different time. But they say to Joshua, beginning in verse 9, chapter 9, Your servants have come from a very far country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard the report of him and all that he did, notice, in Egypt. Now we're going back hundreds of years from the time God took over Egypt and conquered Egypt through the ten plagues. They heard about it, and it touched their hearts. Verse 10, And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon king of Heshbon and to Og king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. So that's why they were afraid. That's why they came and they made this treaty with Joshua, because they were afraid of God of Israel. Family, God is patient with us. Look at the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And see how God is patient with us, just like He was with the Canaanites. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, and then we'll skip to verses 14 and 15. We'll come back to verse 10 and 11 shortly. So 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter says, The Lord is not slow as some count slowness, but is patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everybody to be saved. 
tonight. The sermon is on one of those modern challenges to the ancient faith. Tonight we're going to look at, is Christianity homophobic? Now we all know what the Bible teaches about homosexuality. I'm going to approach this. We're going to see what the Bible says. But I'm going to approach this study a little bit differently. As if I am talking to a gay person himself or herself. And help them understand what God wants from each of us. Christianity is not homophobic. Christianity is sinphobic. Because sin is what's going to keep us out of heaven. God wants everybody to be saved. Drop down to verses 14 and 15 of 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter says, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, that is the second coming of Christ, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace and spotless and blameless and regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. God hasn't come back yet because He's being patient. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. First of all, family, God's justice is patient. Second of all, God's justice is irresistible. We saw in verse 1 of chapter 6 that the walls of Jericho were, were impenetrable. It's got to take a massive army or the God of heaven to bring that wall down. If you still have your Bibles open to 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Family, there's not going to be any stopping the wrath of God from coming against sin and those who continue to practice it. Outside of being associated with Jesus Christ, no sinner is going to be able to stand in the day of judgment. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 6. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul says the wrath of God is coming. That is present tense. The world and the wrath of God are on a collision course. And the only way to be saved from that wrath of God is to be forgiven of our sins through Jesus Christ. Family, God's justice is irresistible. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ to the glory of the Father. Philippians 2 verses 10 and 11. We don't want to be forced to do it on the day of judgment. We want to do it now by our own free will. Third, God's justice is not capricious. God doesn't just decide one day on a whim that He's going to approve of this behavior and disapprove of that behavior. God has always required man to respect Him. God has always required man to respect His fellow man. Always. Everybody is accountable to God. Everybody is answerable to God. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. And so the apostle Peter told the people in Athens that God overlooked man's ignorance in the past. But now He commands all men everywhere to repent. And He's given us confirmation of that judgment by raising Jesus from the dead. That resurrection of Christ, family, is confirmation that there's going to be a judgment day. And right here is what we're going to be judged by. It's no secret. It's no secret. Jesus said in John 12 and verse 48, The words that I have spoken unto you are the words that will judge you in the last day. So read it and study it at home. Pick up these questions about Joshua and read and study Joshua and let your spirit be strengthened by studying the Word of God. And so we need to take seriously the justice of God. The second main point I want to draw from the study of the fall of the walls of Jericho is that we also need to take sin and salvation seriously. Jericho was being judged by God because of their sin. From the perspective of Joshua and the Israelites, Jericho stood in the way of them taking over the promised land. 
Family, it's our sin. It's our self-centered thoughts and behavior and actions and attitudes. That's what separates us from God. That's what causes us to be slaves of Satan. But the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6 and verse 14 that we don't have to allow sin to reign over us. But we submit to Jesus Christ, the King of kings, and we can conquer sin in our lives. We can be victorious in our lives over doubt and over fear and over sin and over temptation. Not through our own strength, but through Jesus Christ. The last text I want us to look at this morning is Colossians chapter 2. Would you open your copy of God's Word to Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. And notice here how Paul puts the credit for being right with God in the hands of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is be united together with Christ. Let's read from God's Word this morning and then we'll bring our study to a conclusion. Beginning in verse 11, Paul says, "...in Christ..." You who were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him by baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith and the working of God, who raised Him from the dead, when you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us, and He's taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And He disarmed rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. How many references in those five verses did Paul make to Jesus Christ? Jesus is our victory. Jesus is the one who made atonement possible. Jesus is the one who came in the flesh so that He could nail sin to the cross. And He calls us to be united together with Him. As Jared led us in that psalm before the sermon, faith is the victory. Confidence in Jesus Christ and then obedience to Christ's commands. And so as we march around the walls of our Jericho, sometimes it feels strange. Sometimes we wonder if God really knows what He's talking about. But we obey because we trust Jesus Christ. And in the end, our trust will be vindicated when we are raised from the dead to the glory of God the Father, our faith will be vindicated. Family trust in Jesus Christ and obedience to His commands are the solution to our fears, our doubts, our disappointments, the disillusionment that we have in life. Let's trust Jesus Christ. And let's make Him the Master of our lives. Thursday and Friday, Rachel and I went camping at the Wilderness State Park up close to the Mackinac Bridge in case you didn't know where it was located. And we took our dog, our dog Dusty. Sometimes we take him with us camping. We took him hiking on Friday afternoon. We're walking out through the hiking trail. We probably go a mile, mile and a half or so. Dusty's getting kind of old. Well, he's getting up in age. He's got a lot of mileage on him, let's say that. In dog years, he's probably in his 70s. We get out about a mile and a half on that trail, and Dusty just stops walking. He just stops. I tug on the leash, and he just stops. He won't go. I said, okay, let's go back to camp. I turn around, and he starts walking just like that. It's like he knows what's going on. If you're at the point in your life where you need to just stop where you're going and turn around and go the opposite direction, you're living a life that's moving you away from Christ, you're at least smarter than Dusty. 
Stop where you're going. And turn around and go back. Come back to Jesus Christ. And renew your faith and your relationship and your zeal for Jesus Christ. And let's start over again. If the elders of Swartz Creek can help you in your walk with Christ this morning, let us know what we can do. Let's stand and sing together.